Hey everyone, Christine Dahl here from Fashion Angel Warrior and thank you so very much for tuning in. We are doing our Facebook and Instagram weekly live. We are back. We took a little bit of a hiatus. I was traveling pretty much the entire month of August, which was crazy. Oh my gosh, note to self, do not go to four different cities in four weeks back to back. Never again. Um, but it was great. We were at Magic in Vegas speaking. I went to Toronto and did the apparel textile sourcing show. Spoke there and then I flew to Chicago and did some speaking at the DG Expo. So it was awesome and I took a little tiny vacation, way too short of a vacation in there as well with my husband. And we celebrated our four year wedding anniversary. So it was great. It was hectic. I'm glad to be back in one place. I'm not flying out for at least another two weeks to LA, so that's good. But anyway, hey, Rakina. So tonight we are going to talk about a case study. These are where we examine famous, successful fashion brands and dissect them and give you our opinion and reasons why we think they're successful so that hopefully you can learn from what they've already done and be successful in your own business. And so tonight we are gonna do the brand round two. Some of you may or may not even know them, um, but they recently popped up on my radar and I thought it was pretty interesting so I wanted to talk about them. So as always, don't forget to share this video. If you're on Facebook, just know that no one can watch it unless they're actually part of the fearless group, but don't let that stop you from sharing. Go ahead and share it. Just let people know, hey, join our group so that you can watch this. And if you're on Instagram, tag someone, share this in your stories. It will be up for 24 hours in our stories and then it will be deleted. So if you do miss the replay or wanna watch it again, go on over to our Facebook group, The Fearless Fashion Printer, and you can watch it there. Hey, Jack's Odyssey, Red and Mommy, thanks so much for joining. Okay, so don't forget to give me your hearts, give me your thumbs up. I want this to be interactive, guys. Talking to yourself is not fun. I wanna hear from you guys. Hey, Star. So do let me know your comments, questions, all that fun stuff as we're going along. All right, so let's dive in. Today we are gonna talk about round two. We're gonna discuss what they're doing on YouTube to build an audience and build suspense, very, very important. Why they don't sell online and they are killing it at brick and mortar, which is crazy with everything that's going on with brick and mortar right now. Uh, we're also gonna discuss how they entice their customers to trade instead of sell, and I'll explain what that means. And we're gonna discuss the nine reasons that they are so successful. So let's talk about round two. First of all, who is round two? Who's actually heard of round two? Let me see a little hand waving emoji or hand raise emoji. Who's actually heard of round two? The fashion brand company, whatever you wanna call them, store. There's a lot of you on. I wanna hear from you guys. Who's held of round? Okay, Travel Designs has not heard of them. Kristen, good to see you again, girl. Anyone else? Has anyone heard of round two? If you're watching the replay, I wanna hear from you as well. So don't think that just because you're watching the replay, you don't have to comment. I want your comments also. Okay. Shop Lim Babe, not me. Okay, Shop Recover Repeat, no. Okay, so a lot of you have not heard of them, which is crazy. Okay, so they started back in 2013. Uh, three guys uh, from Virginia, Sean, Chris, and Luke all started it. And basically they started selling their thrifted vintage gear, sneakers, hoodies, shirts, all that kind of stuff. So they call themselves a buy, sell, trade boutique. They primarily do not make anything new, although that's been added later down the line, but primarily they started as buying vintage items and then reselling it or trading it in, right? So people, customers could come to them with their stuff and trade it in to buy new stuff at the store, right? And so they sell, they specialize in men's premium shoes, streetwear, all that fun stuff, sneakers. They get their inventory from large warehouses. They also get it from a lot of their customers. Hey, So Chic Petite, how are you? Awesome. So they first started out with a small storage unit where they would sell all their stuff. And now they've grown to seven or eight, I think now, locations, don't quote me on that. Uh, spread out all across the US from Virginia, New York, Miami, LA, etc. They've got all the top celebs wearing their stuff. Even Tommy Hilfinger himself 
went to every round two and started buying all of the vintage Tommy stuff. And he's been quoted as saying that he just kind of forgot to do this in the 90s. And so now he wants to create an archive for himself of all his own clothing, which is crazy. Um, they carry all kinds of brands, Tommy, Nike, Supreme, North Face, Off-White, etc. Prices range from anywhere from $125 to $2,000, depending on what the item is. And they have an estimated annual sales of over $20 million. And these guys are young. Like, I think all of them are under 30, which is just crazy to me. Okay. So I did a little uh, calculation on my own here. Uh, they have 15 employees. They have about seven or eight stores. They've been quoted as saying that they make about an average of 30% on each sale. So if you take 30% of 20 million, that's 6 million. You figure overhead for seven locations might be one and a half mil, 15 employees, that might be about one and a half mil. So at the end of the day, they're probably walking away with three million for three guys. That's one million a piece, not bad, right? And they did this in about six years, which is crazy. And they're super, super young. Yes, uh, Aisha, they're kind of like the real, real, yes. Uh, they don't do like Louis Vuitton and Gucci and Chanel. They do like streetwear brands. Yes, very similar concept, exactly. Okay, so let's talk about the nine reasons, in my opinion, that they are successful. Number one, they do what they love. They started this business kind of by accident. Like, they just love streetwear, sneakers. Like, these are sneaker heads, right? Like, we all know them. Maybe you're one of them. I personally am not one of them. But I get it, it's an obsession, right? Every new sneaker that comes out, you have to have it. There's different colors, there's different things, there's collaborations, right? Michael Jordan's, all this stuff, right? So they just kind of started by looking for clothing for themselves and they love what they do, right? They didn't get into the business thinking, all right, well, let's start a business because we wanna make lots of money. They were just like, hey, we love this already, let's just start selling the stuff, right? So they just absolutely love it. Um, Sean, I know, was obsessed with sneakers since he was 10. Luke started working in shoe stores since he was 15. So these guys were definitely starting early on with their passion, and that drove them to kind of build this business. But to be honest, they kind of built it by accident. Um, and I always say there's two kinds of entrepreneurs. There's those who start a business because they're educated and they're choosing to, right? And then there's the ones who kind of do it by accident. And these guys are the ones that kind of grew a business, a $20 million business by accident, which is crazy. And their goal at the end of the day when they started was just to be as nice as possible. They felt like all of their quote unquote competitors at the time when they started in 2013 were all jerks. And so they were like, hey, let's just be like the nice guys on the block. And that was kind of their USP. I mean, there's a lot of other things that they did very well, but that was essentially their USP at the time. So, and for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about when I say USP, USP stands for unique selling proposition. Why would someone buy from you over your competition? And we talk a lot about this in our fashion startup intensive. Hey, Tanya. Hey, Genesis. How are you? Hey, Rocio. Thanks so much for joining. Okay, so number two, the second reason that they are successful, in my opinion, they have a really good eye. Sean is known for knowing what product is going to sell, how much it's going to sell for, the condition that it needs to be in. I mean, there's stuff like he would go to this warehouse and comb through hundreds of thousands of t-shirts, basically, and pick out you know the top 20 that he knows he can get top dollar for. And some of these t-shirts have holes, they have stains, but he knows strategically, okay, that stain is okay because it looks cool or the placement of it or he's gonna do something with it to hide that stain or whatever the case may be. So he has a really good eye. He knows the product, he knows what it's gonna sell for, and he knows what to look for essentially. So that's super, super important. Whatever you're going to do, if you're gonna create product or resell product, anything in the fashion industry, having a good eye is key, definitely, to knowing what's gonna sell, what the trends are, what the latest colors are, what your customers really want at the end of the day. Which leads me to number three, they know their market. They know their target market. They are their target market, essentially. And so they're, they're attracting these young guys that are in their 20s, that are obsessed with streetwear and sneakers and all this kind of crazy stuff, and they know what people are willing to pay for it. You know, even down to the specific 
color of things. So if you watch their YouTube shows, and I'll talk about that in a minute, um, they constantly show people coming into the stores and trading their stuff or trying to sell their stuff to the store. And so one guy came in with all these sneakers and, you know, I'm not a sneaker head, so please don't quote me on the type of sneakers he brought in. But anyway, he had like one red pair and then all these 10 black pairs of sneakers. And the guy was like, oh, no, 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 we don't want the black ones. We only want the red ones. He knew down to the color what he could sell in the store, what people would buy and how much they would pay for it. And he turned that guy away with all of his black sneakers, but he took those red ones and gave him a pretty decent price for it. Um, and these guys are literally like buying things at a thrift store in the middle of like, you know, the country, Nebraska, Alabama for like $6, like buying a t-shirt for like $6, selling it to round two for $250. And then round two is selling it to the public for like $500. Like it's crazy the markup on this stuff. And to somebody like me, I would go in a, in a thrift store and be like, Psh, I'm not going to pay $6 for that Madonna t-shirt. But to somebody like them and their target customer, that person is willing to pay $500 for that Madonna t-shirt, okay? So it's not for everyone. It's definitely a niche, but they know who their niche is and they know exactly who they're targeting. So it's really, really important when you're starting a fashion business. Okay, number four, they started small. They got their proof of concept first. And we've talked about this with the other case studies that we've done. We've done Maison Clio. We've done Red Dress Boutique. Like most of these famous successful fashion brands did not just, you know, one day, oh, let's get $2 million and open up crazy stores and, you know, we're going to be famous and successful. Like they all kind of started small. They all got their proof of concept first before they ventured out into bigger things, right? So these guys started with literally a 10 by 10 storage unit. They were selling out of their storage unit, like on Instagram, like Sean would literally post a picture of him with all the product in the storage unit with his cell phone number saying, hey, hit me up, you know, we're here at the storage unit today, blah, 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 like with the address and everything. Like it was super like lax and like, hey, just come by and buy stuff. Like it was crazy. Um, and then of course they moved into their first store when they started getting outgrowing, I should say that storage unit, which was 10 by 10, which is hundred square feet. But even their first store was only 700 square feet. So it wasn't crazy, crazy big. Um, you know, they took small steps. So definitely, definitely don't jump fully in. You want to get that proof of concept first and make sure that people actually want what it is that you're doing. You might think it's a great idea. But we need to make sure other people think it's a great idea before we really commit to building this, right? Okay, number five. Are you guys liking this so far? We've got nine reasons. I'm up to number five, so we're about halfway through. Yes, awesome. I'm so glad that you're liking it, Shop Lim Bebe. So many great tips, awesome. Okay, cool. Awesome, are you guys liking this on Facebook? I haven't heard from anyone on Facebook and there's a lot of you on. Darnell, Tanya, give me your hearts, give me your thumbs up, Alyssa. Cleo says, awesome. Okay, loving it. Yes, it's great. Okay, cool. Awesome. Okay, number five, timing. So sometimes you just kind of get lucky. And some people know how to time certain trends and time certain things in the market, right? And some people just get lucky. Whether it was luck with them or whether they knew it was the good timing, it was a good time for them to start this type of business. So in 2013, not a lot of people were doing what they're doing. Not a lot of people were buying and reselling vintage, essentially, which is kind of the whole sustainability, recycling movement, like all of that had kind of started becoming very popular at that time. Nasty Gal, if those of you are familiar with Nasty Gal, she kind of started that way. She was buying and reselling vintage stuff on her eBay store. She kind of really took off in around 2011, 2012. So that was starting to become more mainstream, more popular. The whole recycling, upcycling thing was taking off at this time as well. So it was very popular, or it became very popular to start going to thrift stores, vintage stores, upcycling stuff, recycling it, just reselling it, whatever the case. And so they had a really good time to start their business. Had they tried to start this maybe in 2003, or had they waited to 2015, maybe it wouldn't have been as successful. Who knows, right? But timing definitely helped them in this part. So here's a little fun fact for you. I looked this up. The number of products on Etsy and Pinterest tagged with the word upcycled increased 
from the year 2010 to 2011 from 7,900 in 2010 to over 30,000 by 2011. So you can see that this was kind of the sweet spot, 2011, 2012 by 2013, right? It's definitely more mainstream. They're capitalizing on this whole recycling, upcycling trend, right? Miss Cosmopolita, love it. Would be awesome to do a live review of one of your students that has a startup and they're growing. Yes, we actually have done that in the past. So go back and watch some of our old Facebook lives. We've totally done that. Um, the one that comes to mind is with Daniela of Jack's Odyssey, and I know she's on right now. Um, so we did talk about her brand a little bit, even though she's a startup and she's just getting her line off the ground. She has had a lot of success so far. Okay, cool. Um, so obviously by doing vintage, they're kind of in the whole limited edition, you know, sustainability movement just based on the fact that they're doing vintage, right? They're not making anything new. They're literally just recycling old vintage stuff, right? So in and of itself, they're in kind of the sustainability movement. I'm sure if you ask them, hey, are you a sustainable brand? They'd probably say, no, we don't call ourselves that because they're a buy, sell, trade vintage brand, right? That's what they call themselves. Okay, so moving right along. Awesome, you watched it. Okay, cool. Um, number six, they are very creative. So no matter what type of business you have, I don't care if you are, you know, making fertilizer for a living or, you know, you design trucks for a living. Like, I, whatever kind of business you're in, I just feel that creativity is one of the best things you can have, whether it's creativity in the design and the product side of things, whether it's creativity in the marketing and how you're selling the product, like creativity just flat out helps in any way, shape or form. Hey, Michelle, how are you? Hey, Dee, Dion, good to see you on. So they're super creative, Sean especially. Um, he has been known for taking a lot of the vintage stuff that he buys tie dyeing it literally himself like in his backyard and then reselling it and he kind of does this to make things a little bit more interesting i also think it's a way that he kind of hides some of the stains sometimes and different things right but he makes it super cool and fun and hip whatever and tie dyes a lot of stuff he also does a lot of collaborations with a lot of other brands and obviously because they've gotten so popular a lot of brands have been coming to them for these collaborations so one of them was guess so guest jeans came to them they wanted to do this whole like vintage remake of guests clothing blah 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 so sean came up with this idea to do a farmer's market pop-up like literally like farmer's market like there was produce and everything at this pop-up but it was all guest inspired and he partnered with all these different brands and it was like this huge awesome amazing event like people came from all over the world people traveled from like sydney australia to come to this thing it was in LA, I believe it was last year in 2018, and the line to get in was like down the block, people were camped out overnight, like it was crazy. And they, they even went down the line and were asking people like, why are you here, where are you from, all that stuff, and almost every single person they interviewed knew exactly what they wanted to buy once they got into the pop-up. Once they got into the event, they knew exactly what they wanted to buy. Like that's promoting your stuff ahead of time and teasing people enough ahead of time so that they already know what they wanna buy so that when they go into that pop-up, they beeline to whatever it is they're looking to buy, the striped shirt, the rainbow, whatever hat. You know, they could, they could spit off the top of their head exactly what they wanted to buy. So obviously they had been promoting this thing well in advance on social media. Hint, hint, this is something I mention all the time. I know I sound like a broken record, but they were promoting this thing well in advance to get people lined up interested and ready to purchase and it was crazy like I watched the video and it was an awesome event I wish I had known about it even though it's not my style or whatever it was just kind of a cool event and if I had been in LA I would have loved to stop by um they had like a, a skateboard pipe there half pipe you know whatever and all that kind of stuff um music live music they had food obviously all that great stuff and then they had all these little pop-up little clothing brands all over the place. So it was cool. It was definitely an experience, which leads me to number seven. Yes, good marketing. It was really good marketing. I mean, they had beanbag chairs. Like they had stuff that they knew related to their target customer, all right? 
they knew their their target customer were these sneaker heads, these streetwear guys, these skateboarders, right? Like they don't want regular chairs. Like they want something loungy that's like a beanbag chair, right? Like, and it all had branded guest stuff on it. It was great. It was totally great. Um, okay, so which leads me to number seven. They utilized social media early on and they did something really cool with social media. So they grew to over 800 thousand followers across all of their Instagram platforms and they were definitely using an Instagram very very early on um, I forget when Instagram first came out I think it was 2011 don't quote me on that but they started in 2013 and they were definitely using Instagram in the early days and they would post multiple days m multiple posts a day showing all the things that they had in store so obviously they were not selling online they needed to attract people to come into the store so they were constantly taking pictures of product posting it online and driving people to the store that way. Now, I know I don't recommend this typically to post lots of pictures of your product, but in this case for them, it works because these products, these items are one of a kind, they're vintage. People are literally coming to the store specifically for X, Y, and Z type of product. If you love Supreme, you know every single Supreme thing out there that they've ever made, and it's also limited edition stuff. And so if there's something missing from your closet that you're like, oh my gosh, I, I wish I could find this. And then round two shows it to you on Instagram, you're gonna love it. You're gonna go to the store and buy it, right? So in this case, it works. Not all the time that works, but in this case it does. But they were very, very clever with their YouTube channel. And they actually didn't start their YouTube channel right away. So they started YouTube in 2015. So two years after they started which of course they would have probably grown even larger had they started right when they did launch their company in 2013. But they have a pretty decent YouTube following. It's over 189,000 subscribers. And they did something really good to A, build their audience and also build the suspense. And so they started putting together videos, what they called the show. And so they turned their YouTube channel literally into a reality TV show. I mean, you think about what you watch on TV, most people watch some form of reality TV. And so they made their store reality TV and they just went around filming every single thing that happened in the store. People coming in, people buying stuff, people bringing their stuff, trading it. I mean, they get right down to telling you, like showing you what they're paying for stuff and then what they're marking it up as. Like they're not trying to hide anything. And they know they don't have to because people are coming to pay this stuff, right? To pay for this stuff. And so they have these like hour long, sometimes almost two hour long episodes called The Show on their YouTube channel. And this is how they grew a really, really big following. And actually they did a ton of teaser videos and there's almost one teaser vid video for every show video on their YouTube channel, which helps to create suspense. And so if I can't drill this in your head enough, you need to create suspense. If you're working on something, give people a little teaser, give people a little snippet of what it is that you're working on and tell them, hey, it's coming in six months, it's coming in three months, we're working on this, it's gonna be launched in spring 2020, right? Like people get super excited when you're giving them little teasers like that. Also, for instance, when I did the Facebook Live tonight, I did a little teaser video two hours ago letting you know, hey, we're gonna do a Facebook and Instagram Live at 8 p.m., right? It gets you excited, it gets you tuned in. This is really, really key. So if you take away anything from this whole episode, teaser videos as much as possible, okay? Miss Cosmopolita wants to know something, hold on. I guess what I mean is this, for example, I still can't figure out my TA and if we do a review of my TA, what I think it is, and you're telling me where you think I'm wrong, stuff like that. I think I missed something. What's TA? Is it time in action? Let me know. Okay, I'm a little lost. You can always private message me too. Okay, so where are we at? Okay, so teaser videos. Okay, we're up to number eight. Number eight is they capitalized off that following. So it's one thing to build a following. It's another thing to start using it to your advantage. Hey, Natasha, how are you? And so Sean specifically, I mean, all of them are, are pretty much influencers at this point, but Sean has now become a huge influencer. I forget how many followers he has on his own personal Instagram page. And so a lot of big brands have now come to them asking for collaborations. And so Sean is now literally a designer 
for things like Nike, Guess, Disney, Lacoste, like all these big brands. And he's designed capsule collections, of course, limited edition, exclusive collections, right? He wants to keep that limited edition vibe and he knows that obviously it's gonna sell out that way. And I think that he was commissioned to do a sneaker design by Nike and it sold out like the first day within a couple hours or something. So it's crazy. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he gets a ton more collaborations, but hey, once you've got the following, it leads to so many more things, which again goes back to why I always say, build your following first, or at the very least, build your following while you're building your product. Please, please do not wait until you have your product and then think now it's time to start building a following, okay? And we have a ton of digital management services. If you're like, hey, I don't have time to build stuff on social media, we can do it for you. We have packages as low as $150 a month. Most of our services are month to month. That is crazy, guys. Like you cannot find another digital marketing agency out there that's gonna charge you anything under $1,000 a month. Like, and trust me, I've looked, so I know. Target audience. It's in regards to a live review ideas for your live. Okay, I'm gonna have to go back and look at your message. You can't figure out your target audience. If we do a review of your target audience, we should just set up a strategy session. Or I think you're in the Facebook uh, fashion uh, startup intensive, right? Let me know. I think you're in that group. If you are, let's talk about this in the Facebook group, the private Facebook group, and I'll answer all your questions in there, okay? Cool. Hey, Ashley Coleman, how are you? Okay, so they capitalize off building their following. And number nine, last but not least, and these are not in any particular order, in my opinion, they are successful because they create an in-store experience and they know how to get people to shop. There are a lot of brick and mortar stores right now that are dying. They cannot get people even into the store, let alone get them to buy something once they are in the store. So this is the reason, obviously, we talked about a little bit why they don't sell online and why they're killing it with brick and mortar. It's because A, they're selling one of a kind stuff. It would make no sense to have a website. So if they had a website, they would put it up and within minutes it would be sold. Like they'd constantly have to put new product up and that wouldn't make any sense whatsoever. And on top of that, it's all about the experience for these guys, these sneaker heads, these streetwear brands, like they love to, you know, build relationships and collab and partner and talk to each other and look at what each other's wearing. And you don't get to do that online. Like there's no interaction. So they don't sell online. They have a website. It literally is like nothing. It's horrible. It's the worst website I've ever seen. Um, they don't even have their phone number or an email address, I don't think, on the website. They might have updated the email address. Um, but like there's just the three of them and their bios. And then I think not even all of their stores are even updated on the website. Like it's, it's really a horrible website. Um, but they are killing it with their brick and mortar stores. And once their customers come into the store, they know how to entice them to purchase. And one of the ways they do that is by enticing their customers to trade their stuff rather than sell their stuff. So a lot of people come into the store looking to make money. And so they've gone to thrift stores and bought a bunch of stuff or they have stuff at home, whatever it is. And they go and they say, here you go, here's all my stuff, how much will you give me for it? And they always, 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 I've noticed, quote the person, by saying we'll give you X amount of dollars in cash, let's say for instance $80 in cash for all this, or we'll give you $100 in store credit. And so if you're smart, you would take the $100 in store credit, it's more than the $80, right? But for them, it's better for them to give you the higher price because they're making a markup on whatever you buy in the store. So they're now encouraging you, okay, we're giving you money for this, but we're encouraging you to spend that money in our store so it's going back into our own pocket. And that's how they're super, super successful. So you might not have an actual in-store experience or you might not have an actual brick and mortar store, but, and you might not be trading things, right? But think about ways that you can use this scenario to offer people better value, but then put more money in your pocket, right? And there's ways that we talk about this in our how to drive traffic online and boost sales online course. So that's it for tonight, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. These are my nine tips on why round two is super successful. Hopefully you learned a lot from it. Give me your hearts, give me your thumbs up. I love it, it's like oxygen to me. Definitely go back and watch our previous Facebook Live case studies. We did one on Maison Cleo, it's number 77. I put a link in the Facebook description. 
There's also number 75. We did Red Dress Boutique, which was awesome. If you're on Instagram, all you have to do is head on over to our Facebook group, The Fearless Fashionpreneur. There's a link in my bio. You can join our exclusive group and you can watch literally over 40 hours of free live trainings. Like this is sick, guys. I literally need to start charging for these Facebook lives. <laughs> Also, we have three tickets left for our LA manufacturing tour, which is happening October 1st. Definitely get your tickets now. These events always sell out. People are constantly emailing me after it sells out. Hey, can you fit one more? And the answer is no. We have a van. It fits only a certain number of people and that's it. Once it's full, it's full. So definitely head on over to latour5.eventbrite.com to grab your ticket. We are not doing as many Q and A's any longer, Jack Sadisy is asking, um, but we'll try to do them every once in a while, so I'll keep you posted. Yes, DM me, Truffle. Okay, cool. Uh, also, we'll be in LA October 2nd through the 4th for the LA Textile Show. We'll be speaking on the step-by-step -step strategy of what you need before you launch your fashion brand. So if you're in LA, definitely pop on by the LA Textile Show. I would love to meet you, say hi, see you in person. A lot of you I have never even met and it would be wonderful to meet you in person. So stop on by, we'll be there October 2nd through the 4th. And then next week, next Tuesday, we'll be back again, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. And we're gonna talk about the red flags when sourcing a factory. You definitely don't wanna miss it. So mark your calendar and I'll see you all then. Thanks so much, everyone. Good to seeing everyone. It's so good to be back and have a great night. Ciao.